Good morning, church. Good morning. So just a few reminders today. Today, after service, is the 98th annual meeting of Augustana Lutheran Church. We encourage all voting members to come join us downstairs in the social hall for the meeting and for a lovely afternoon meal. Uh, pardon our dust. <laughs> As you can see, we have some scaffolding and there might be some lingering dust around. Uh, Craig and the entire album team have been working diligently all week uh, in upgrading our sound system. We have a new sound board. We have new mics over the choir. Um, there are hearing assisting devices for the hearing impaired um, and much more to come. So our Thanks and appreciation to all those who have supported Album financially and to the team who have worked so hard this week in getting things ready for us. Yes, a hand of applause, yes. Next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, uh, will be a super celebration, celebration for Pastor Tom and his family. It will be our time to say farewell to them um, and get ready to welcome Pastor Kathy the following week. Uh, the congregation is encouraged to bring chips, dips, and appetizers. The welcoming committee will bring subs. Uh, if you have any questions, please see Sid Stoltz or Ben Cutler. Uh, if anybody is interested to go down to the White House for the peaceful for support for refugees, that is from 1 to 4, please see Denise after service. Uh, those interested will march down right after the congregational meeting. It is my pleasure to welcome Vincent, Pastor Vincent Gus this morning, who will be preacher and celebrant. Uh, Gus is a member of Augustana who is currently serving, um, teaching clinical ethics to medical students at Georgetown and providing ethics consulting um, to Inova and Kaiser Permanente. So we welcome Gus this morning. Um, and then I'm going to close with a letter from Pastor Kathy that she sent me last evening. Dear Augustana Par Parish, on this, your annual meeting, two weeks before my first Sunday with you, I send you greetings and my fervent prayers. As I wrap things up here in my hometown of Columbia, Missouri, you were very much on my mind and in my heart, especially in this grave time as a country. It is daily every more clear to me that the church has a vital life-giving mandate specific to this time and place. I am grateful that we have been called together at Augustana for the living of these days and pray for the wisdom and courage to face this hour, confident in the renewing grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. As I bid goodbye to people I have known my entire life and look forward to beginning anew in your midst, I trust that the love that created the universe, called us into being, and brings us together in church is more than sufficient to sustain us and in fact is leading us into new paths of service and witness. I also trust that despite wanting with every ounce of my being to be starting already, I can spend the next week packing, preparing, and driving out to DC and know that you are being Christ's church in the meantime. Thank you to Pastor Tom Montgomery, Eric Randolph, the Congregational Council, the Call Committee, and to all of you and your wonderful ministry. On a practical note, I begin the drive out there this coming Saturday and plan to arrive on Sunday. A good friend is helping me with the drive, for which I am very thankful. On Monday, February 6th, trusted local movers from here will be unloading my belongings into the apartment next door and into the church office. I look forward to gathering with the Lydians in their lunch meeting on February 7th and the beginning in earnest on February 8th. Until then, you are in my prayers blessings as you gather in your annual meeting and in all the ways you are being the body of Christ in this time. Yours in Christ, Pastor Kathy Rosenholt. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin, to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you all the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, you confound the world's wisdom in giving your kingdom to the lowly and poor in heart. Give us such, give us such hunger and thirst for justice and perseverance in striving for peace that in words and deeds the world may see the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. first reading is from the sixth chapter of the book of Micah. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy The second reading is from the first chapter of the first book of Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, 
Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up into the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Way back in the 70s, I was actually in seminary at that time, there was a, a movie, an exciting movie, in the theaters called The Poseidon Adventure. Maybe some of you remember it. But in case you don't or have never seen that movie, let me share with you this morning 
something I found interesting in that movie and that just might relate to our text that you just heard read today. Now, the SS Poseidon was a luxury ocean liner that all of a sudden was hit with a freak wave and it turned upside down. So everything that was, the bizarre thing was everything that was on top is down. The hull was on top and the decks were underneath water. Stairways were upside down, uh, doors were upside down, even the Christmas tree was upside down. It was a whole new world for those people in there wanting to get out desperately before the ship totally sunk. The drama of the movie was how the people began to realize their predicament, that the ship was turning over, and how they responded to it to find a way out. There were disagreements about who to follow and the uh, best route to take and the safest way to exit this disorienting, upside-down world. In our gospel today, Jesus is signaling that a freak wave has hit. The ship of life, of institutions, of values, of religion itself has turned it upside down. With his coming into the world, everything has changed. Values that were held as important have been turned on their head. The Sermon on the Mount, which begins with today's text often referred to as the Beatitudes, reflect that upside-down nature, or should I say, right-side-up living in an upside-down world. Now, folks think of the Sermon on, uh, on the Mount as a long series of Jesus' sayings captured in the fifth to the seventh chapters of Matthew, and in Luke there's another version. It's a pretty long sermon, and I promise you my sermon won't be nearly as long today. But uh, scholars really don't think of this as one sermon, it's a series of teachings and proclamations that Jesus made throughout his ministry that Matthew and Luke thought was important to record. Also, when we uh, think of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're given all the many art portrayals of it, like in our bulletin today, we think of, imagine people uh, from all around, all different backgrounds, coming to the mountain and sitting down and hearing uh, Jesus speak. In fact, some years ago, when I was on a joint uh, Jewish-Christian uh, tour through the Holy Land, I remember coming down from the high mountains of the Golan Heights on the Syrian and northern Israel border, down to the beautiful, huge body of water known as the Sea of Galilee, and just adjacent are some foothills where our tour guide said legend has it that Jesus preached a sermon on the mount there. But if you look at Scripture closely, it's, uh, it doesn't say that. It says... When Jesus saw the crowds coming, he, not they, he went up into the mountains and sat down. And his disciples, presumably the twelve that he had just called in the previous chapter, were following him and sat down. Jesus was actually separating from the crowd at first and spoke to his disciples these, this sermon on the mount, this, these beautiful words known as the Beatitudes. And in so doing, he was showing himself as that freak wave who changes everything upside down. He gave them a vision, an inspiration to go back to those crowds and show them where the way was to healing and justice and hope and peace and good news. But what exactly are the Beatitudes? The word comes from the Latin word beatus, meaning blessed. The Greek word, uh, which is actually similar to the Hebrew word that Jesus probably spoke, uh, in Matthew and Luke's record is makaroi. And there is no Latin or English or a modern language equivalent to that word. I think the King James and the NIV and the first RSV translations were best when it records blessed are those, as we heard read just now. It comes closest to the meaning of the word. But more recent translations are happy are those or fortunate are those or congratulations to those or how wonderful are those. All these concepts are included in the word makaroi. The popular evangelist of the last century, Billy Graham, called the Beatitudes the beautiful attitudes. It's one way to remember them. But how in the world, in any place, time, or location can you say the Beatitudes are beautiful except for the poetic structure of them? How can the, those who are poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungry, thirsty, persecuted, and reviled be blessed or happy? Those who are merciful and pure in heart and peacemakers are often seen as naive, unrealistic, and weak. 
how can life be wonderful for these people? How can they be blessed? You see, the problem with Jesus' teachings is that most people, maybe human nature itself, really says wonderful news for my life, gospel good news, can be measured only in success and wealth and popularity and, and power. In fact, some people, like some of our current leaders, actually want to say they even, even have more success and popularity than they have. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us, at least some of the time, do believe that the wonderful news for our lives are measured in how much money we have or how much power or popularity or success. Living upside down rather than right side up in an upside down world is going to cause problems. It's going to cause people to think you're a little odd, a little weird. It's going to make us look naive when we uh, trust people whom society doesn't trust. When we keep people out of our country that we don't feel safe with, and we want to have that. Or when we value and give dignity to people who are hurting that society is unable to give. Last year, um, when Marion and I were a part of a uh, really active and an Episcopal congregation in Springfield, Missouri, we saw how those people did live that odd life because of the forms of mission-minded ministries that they were doing, opening their church regularly for the poor in the neighborhood to eat, providing clothing for those who needed it, even sponsoring a mission called uh, Safe to Sleep for homeless women who couldn't find shelter uh, when it got nighttime and they were lonely and in a dangerous place. In fact, uh, Marion was uh, with those uh, people when they, we opened the fellowship room of a church uh, stayed with these homeless women all night. Perhaps some were afraid that the church furniture might get damaged and nicked. Maybe there was fear that the expensive electronic equipment and the sacramental vessels might be taken, or abusive partners might show up. But just as we experience in the missions we have at Augustana, like Martha's Table or N Street Ministries or the uh, Criminal Justice Initiative and many more, we find ourselves with people on the margins of life who are experiencing that markaroi, that blessedness in the presence of Jesus that we share with them, in the value and dignity that God gives to them through us, and the joy that they begin to know and appreciation they show, even in the midst of, the, of darkness and fear. Now, what the Beatitudes are not they are not a list of the only people whom God blesses. They are not a list of pious aims and vague promises of some future bliss. It is not a moral code or good advice. Rather, it, they are good news, wonderful news, gospel to those who are hurting. The scholar uh, William Barclay wrote, These Beatitudes are not a list of hopes of what will be. They are not glowing and vague prophecies of some future bliss. They are congratulations on what is. Now, it's been said that the Beatitudes, in fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount, is the New Testament equivalent to the Torah, the Old Testament law that was given to Moses on another mountain. However, I believe that instead of a law about how we should feel and how we should behave, uh, they are more a key to interpretation of the Old Torah. It's not about shoulds and oughts and must-dos, but rather it is a beatific vision of what already is the inbreaking of God's reign, the law of love, of grace, regardless what or who is broken, hurting, mournful, in conflict or troubled conditions. In our second lesson this morning, Paul tells the Corinthian church that this message is foolishness. To those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God who chose the foolish to shame the wise, the weak to shame the strong, the low and dis hurting to change everything upside down. Jesus gives this vision to his disciples on that mountaintop so that they can show the crowds at the bottom of the hill how the values of this world are turned upside down. Because that freak wave, Jesus, has come and intervened into history. 
God's values are breaking in then and there in ancient Palestine where poor people with their threatening Mideast religion known as Judaism and its vulnerable community were being oppressed by a foreign power who were in influencing local narcissistic, egotistic despots. Oh, in case you're wondering who I'm talking about, of course I'm talking about Herod and Rome. But uh, history has a way of repeating itself. When power is sought by increasing the poverty of spirit, people feel. Jesus, Jesus, this freak wave, empowered his followers then and now to be merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers in the midst of it all. About a thousand years earlier, in another troubled and an oppressive time for God's people, God gave the prophet Micah insight and courage to proclaim to the powerful then what the Lord requires. Not lip service, not empty worship, but simply to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Now, 2,000 years later, after Jesus first proclaimed this beatific vision, Jesus calls us to the mountain, to this fellowship of Augustana, gathered around his word and real presence in the sacraments, to reveal to us a new perspective about how to escape the upside-down values in this world that gives all glory to success, power, and wealth and security. The risen Lord inspires us and empowers us to live in a way that looks foolish to the world, to be sure, because we identify and serve and care for those who are hurting and on the margins of life as we are becoming Christ's own risen body in this community and in this world. And therefore, rejoicing and being glad in the midst of the world's dark values and conditions, in this fellowship here and in the mission we share out there, we already experience that reward that we have in heaven and celebrate it as an adventure with Jesus who is in, with, under, above, and all around us and especially through us here and now, blessing those around us. That is the blessedness of the Beatitudes. Amen. The peace of God that passes all human understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
justice, peace, and healing. We pray for wholeness in the body of Christ. Bind up fractures within the church. Humble the proud, lift up the lowly, and make us one at your table. Guide our bishops, Elizabeth and Richard, our pastor Tom, our celebrant Vincent, and all your servants in the ways of justice and mercy. Hear us, O God. We praise you for the beauty and bounty of your universe. Open our eyes to all the wonders we so often take for granted or ignore. Mold us into stewards of your creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for peacemakers around the world. Bless their efforts to end violence and restore communities, especially in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Guide all political leaders to carry out their responsibilities in honesty and fairness. Today, we lift up in particular refugees and all those caught in the uncertainties of immigration orders. Sustain them in this time of trial and touch the hearts of those who make and enforce our laws. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for our neighbors who mourn, who have no clean water, who hunger. Provide their daily bread. Heal the forgotten, the lost, and our enemies, family, and friends. We lift up to you our members as they cope with health concerns, employment challenges, legal problems, or financial hardships. We pray for Chuck, Elizabeth, Betty, Bob, Mary, Thomas, Randall, Novella, Edith, Warren, Alex and Olivia, Carol, Pearl, Herman, Diane, Laura, Heidi, David, Ruth, Renee, Eric, Austin, Margaret, Ingrid, Graciela, Anna and Herman, Diane, Mary, Craig, Norma, Joy, Carol, Nicole, Shadana, Al, Deborah, Mike, and Trace. We ask your blessings as well on our family and friends, Joanne, Monica, McKenna, the family of James Morrison, Michael and Robert, Sarah, Roberto, the Oromo people, the people of El Salvador, John, Nancy, Dennis, and the Scalise family. Hear us, O oh God. We praise you for our communities of Augustana, Santa Maria, and the Swedish Congregation of Washington. Bless and strengthen the bonds of faith and fellowship that bind us together. Expand our discipleship and equip us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We praise you for all the saints who died proclaiming the gospel. Strengthen us through their witness. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him to be your beloved son. And in the miracle of the water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the hurt hurts on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from captivity, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news and blessedness in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the same manner, he took the cup, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to all his disciples, saying, Drink this cup, all of you. It is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For with this bread and cup, we remember the life of our Lord offered for us, and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised peace. Let the people say, All men, come, Lord Jesus. Amen, come, Lord Jesus. Said now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, 
that we who share Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Let the people say, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and place. Unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.